Hello, this is another one of Dr. Sadler's Chalk and Talks in the series that I've started in order to answer questions at greater length that have been posed to me in other forums, uh, sometimes through email, sometimes through VU or other electronic media. The question that I'm going to tackle today, and we'll only get too, you know, so far into because we only have uh, 10 to 15 minutes, is a very contested one. Should religion be taught in public schools? And uh, one of my V user friends uh, asked me that question. It prompted a lot of other questions uh, about K through 12 education and church and state and all sorts of other related issues. So I wanted to talk about this. This is something that I have uh, given a lot of thought to. I used to teach uh, not only philosophy but also religious studies in a college setting. And I would often be called upon to come into local high schools, uh, as I have down here in Fayetteville, to give talks about uh, world religions. Now you might ask, how can that be done? Uh, why should that be done? Doesn't that violate the, the separation of church and state? Um, those are very valid questions. And those are things which ought to be explored. I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about this, this topic. And so one place to begin with, one of the issues to start with, is the constitutionality of it. Is it allowable to teach anything pertaining to religion in a public school? Um, it's very clear from Supreme Court cases that you can't hold religious observances, you cannot uh, require prayer, you can't even offer an opportunity for a moment of silence because that may make other students feel uncomfortable, as if they're being discriminated against. Um, so how can you actually teach about religion in a public school? Well, the Supreme Court actually considered cases like this uh, in the course of discussing cases where there had been some clear infringement of somebody's constitutional rights under the First Amendment. And uh, two of these cases that are particularly interesting, Engel versus Vitale and Abingdon versus Shem, there were discussions, uh, you know, these are sort of side notes, but they are revelatory of an attitude that the Supreme Court has towards a certain type of teaching in respect to religion. In Engel versus Vitale, you find uh, an assertion that the history of man is inseparable from the history of religion. So, we'll come back to this in a moment. What that means is that if you're going to adequately teach the history of, of humankind, you have to have some room in there for teaching about religion. And if you're going to teach it well, you have to teach the parts that pertain to religion well. You know, or else you would be teaching an ideological perspective. If you were to try to strip religion away entirely, that would not be adequate teaching. Um, in uh, Abingdon versus Shem, Justice Brennan, in a concurring opinion, wrote, the holding of the court today, because they were holding that uh, you could not require um, Bible teaching as such in public schools, he said, the holding of the court today plainly does not foreclose teaching about the Holy Scriptures or about the differences between religious sects in literature or history. Indeed, whether or not the Bible is involved, it would be impossible to teach meaningfully many subjects in the social sciences or the humanities without some mention of religion. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, you notice he's talking about several different classes. Uh, you can teach religious texts, and you can teach about religious movements, about religious ideas, about mindsets, about tenets of religion, in a, a variety of different classes. You can teach about them in literature classes or you know, in English classes. You can teach about them in humanities. You can teach them about them in history, and you can teach about them in social science. Those are all mentioned explicitly. Um, now, why would you want to do that? So here's one of the questions that I, I like people to think about. What would be lost or what would be diminished in a child's education, K through 12, by not teaching about certain topics? Well, you know, you 
leave a hole in their education. And if it's just a matter of teaching certain facts, perhaps those holes could be filled in later on. But consider what education is. Is education merely learning a bunch of different facts which then you put together in any way you like? No, it goes beyond that. What else is involved in education? Well, there's learning certain skills, certain dispositions, certain attitudes, certain modes of, of being, modes of behaving. You learn, for instance, how to do research, or at least I hope that you do. You learn uh, certain technical things, how to use computers. Um, but you also learn about what we call the great ideas. The sort of facts, if you want to call them such, around which other things coalesce. So, for example, if you want to understand why the pilgrims came over here to the United States, you need to know something about religion, and not just religion in general, but about Christianity, and not just Christianity in general, but about what was going on in the Church of England and on the continent, the European continent, in terms of the Protestant Reformation. You, in order to understand the mindset, and really in order to fully understand the writings and the, the illusions and the arguments, of some of the pilgrims and some of the Puritans, you need to know something about Calvinism. And you need to know something about the Church of England and its developments. And in order to do that, you need to know something about the Roman Catholic Church, against which they were all reacting. Um, and in order to do that, you need to know something about the differences between them, and where they, where they split off from each other, and why. You notice you need to know a lot of things in order to make sense out of that one phenomenon. We could go on and on and on. If you want to understand the cultures of the world, you absolutely have to know something about certain major world religions. You need to know about Islam. You need to know about Hinduism. You need to know about Buddhism. You also need to know about um, some of the uh, religions that are, that are peculiar to particular ethnic groups, like Chinese uh, folk religion. That helps to understand a lot of things. Uh, Confucianism, uh, not, you know, originally starting out in China, but deeply influencing Japanese culture and Korean culture. So to deprive a child of learning about those things is really to stymie and to set back their education. It's to generate somebody who is, whether they like it or not, in some ways an ignoramus. You deprive them of some of the major things that they need in order to peg, in order to constellate ideas, conceptions, historical movements, you know. Um, and, and I'm not saying that you have to supply them with something like a, a uh, you know, comprehensive education in world religions, but you do have to provide them with something. Otherwise, you are, in fact, in some way doing those children harm by not fully educating them. There's a distinction that we can make that gets made in these Supreme Court cases that's very important to keep in mind. This is why a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the notion of talking about religion in schools, because they don't make a distinction between teaching religion on the one hand, which would mean taking a particular stand that a, a one religious group or one subdivision of that group has got things fundamentally right and teaching those texts as if they are uh, you know, revealing absolute truth and teaching, here's the key word, about religion. There is absolutely no problem in teaching about religion. As a matter of fact, in these Supreme Court cases, they are affirming that you ought to be teaching about religion and if you are not doing so, and you're not doing so in a competent manner, you are actually depriving students of a full education. Um, what does it mean to then to teach about religion? This is what we call the religious studies model. We don't commit ourselves to truth claims. We can make truth claims along the lines of Buddhists believe that the Four Noble Truths are true, 
um, and we can say, here's what the Four Noble Truths are, all life is suffering, etc., etc., etc. We can, we can actually require students to, to engage in rote memorization of them. But we're not doing catechism. We're not saying you must memorize these because these are true. We're saying you must memorize these because this will help you understand the mindset, the culture, the arguments, the claims made by this entire group of people. Uh, and that's something valuable. You're not committing yourself to the truth of Buddhism or the truth of Christianity or, or whether the Roman Catholics have got it right about, say, the authority of the Pope or whether the Protestants have got it. You're not actually making truth claims about that. What you are making claims about is that it is true that such and such a group believes this, practices this, that this is an important value for them. And I like to stress this in terms of the difference between understanding and agreement. I used to teach uh, religious studies in a maximum security prison. And I found that the students were uh, very interested in talking about religion. And they would always want to get into doctrinal disputes about well, who's actually right. And I would, I would say, well, we can't, uh, we can't decide that here. That's not what we're going to do. It's enough just to try to understand. And really, if you study any of the world's religions, what you do find out, they are so complex. There's so many things going on in them. They have so many texts, so many interpretations so many rituals, such a wide universe of meaning, and such long histories full of people debating about these very things, that just to try to acquire understanding, that takes a lot. So just to acquire understanding of why Hindus might say that God manifests himself uh, throughout time under different guises, that's something worth exploring. That's more than a class session. That could be an entire week just going into that and going into the intricacies of the notion of the avatar. Um, you don't require anybody to agree with you. You don't require anybody to say, I believe this and um, that is what we are going to do in class and I'm comfortable with it because it's reinforcing or pushing onto others or proselytizing about my beliefs. Now, people may feel threatened by talking about other religions, but so long as you're not actually requiring them to change their beliefs, to change their views, um, that's fine. What are some of the problems? Well, do we have teachers who are capable of doing this? I think in large part the answer is um, no. High school teachers, middle school teachers, they have to study a lot of other things. Some of them may have acquired the sort of education that you find in, in religious studies, um, but many of them have not, and, and they would feel rightly uncomfortable in trying to introduce this sort of thing. What do I think is a solution? Bring in experts. Bring in people for guest lectures. Um, provided they can, they can say that they are not going to stress truth claims and that they are going to focus on understanding instead of agreement, they're not going to proselytize, bring in the people who have degrees in religious studies, in philosophy of religion, even those in theology, because if somebody's good at theology and they're, they're not, you know, just a, um, uh, a pedant, they ought to be able to explore and explain other perspectives. Uh, I could talk more about that, perhaps I will in another one. Here's one of the questions I want to leave off with. Intolerance. What should we do about intolerance when we're teaching about intolerance? Obviously, we don't have to make truth claims that you know they are right in being intolerant um, or that uh, they are wrong in being intolerant. But how do we teach about it? That's a question worth exploring. Um, how do we teach about it without being intolerant ourselves towards those who have discrimination of different sorts, who say some people are right and some people are wrong? That's a bigger issue, and that's one that has to be explored further. I believe there are some very good solutions to it, but I'm going to leave off here.